Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Murphy. I work with the Marxist Education Project uh, in New York City. For those of you who are not familiar with the MEP, we have been in existence uh, in about for about 10 years. Uh, initially, we were doing all of our programming live and in person in New York, but when the pandemic arose in 2020, we moved our events and classes online, and since then, we've developed a uh, modestly but somewhat uh, global audience with uh, folks from many parts of the country and the world uh, joining us for uh, classes and events on Marxism, politics, history, science and technology, uh, literature, uh, and other topics that you can find at www.marxedproject.org. Uh, today, we're very happy to welcome Lee Claire LeBerge, uh, the author of the wonderful new book, Marx for Cats. Uh, Lee is a uh, professor of English at Borough Manhattan Community College in New York, uh, and is the author as well of Wages Against Artwork, Decommodified Labor, and the Claims of Socially Engaged Art. Uh, so Lee is going to speak for about uh, 30, 40 minutes, at which point we will have plenty of time for conversation with Lee, discussion, questions and comments on her book. Hopefully a number of you have read it by now, or at least parts of it. Uh, if you haven't, you're in for a treat. Uh, so without further ado, Lee Claire LeBurge, welcome. Hi, Fred. Hi, everybody. Uh, so nice to see so many names from uh, all over. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, I see comrades and friends from Europe, uh, from Brooklyn, from Massachusetts. Uh, really nice to be here with you guys today. Um, of course, one of the benefits of doing a, a Zoom talk, a Zoom lecture, is that people can have their cats join them. So no need to limit this to the cat jokes. Feel free to bring your cats into the screen. Um, the book was written, you know, with cats, with cats on my mind and the company of cats, so it would be most appropriate. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'll sort of talk a little bit about the genesis of the book and read a little from it. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about the French Revolution uh, and the role cats played therein, um, and a little bit about the Haitian Revolution, too. Um, all right, so let's get this started. Okay. So today I want to speak from my recently published book uh, with Duke University Press, Marks for Cats. Um, the, the gambit of the book is that the history of Western capitalism can be told through the cat and that doing so reveals a heretofore unrecognized animality at the heart of Marxist critique and of Marxist critique. That animality has most often been feline and it has been present in how Marxists have represented what constitutes the economy and how they have imagined how the economy could be transformed from a site of exploitation into one of equality. From capitalism's feudal prehistory to its contemporary moment of globalization, those seeking to maintain economic power as well as those th seeking to challenge it have recruited cats into their efforts. Medieval kings and lords styled themselves as lions. Dissidents from the medieval order were identified through their relationships with domestic cats. The first real capitalist empire, Great Britain, adopted a leonine symbol, while some of the most powerful worker actions against capitalism have been known as wildcat strikes. In the 18th century, French and Haitian revolutionaries were denigrated as tigers by conservatives who opposed them. In the 1960s and 70s, 
in the United States, the Black Panther Party insisted that capitalism was a fundamentally racist system and demanded its overturning. History's most robust critic of capitalism, Karl Marx himself, likewise has a feline genealogy. He's a descendant of the famous Katz and Ellen Bogan line of Ashkenazi Jews who first hailed from the Rhineland uh, in present-day Germany, but fled to Venice in the early 16th century. Katz and Ellen Bogan translates from the German as Katz Elbow, and today in the Jewish cemetery in Padua, outside Venice, Italy, Marx's family tombstones are each marked with the images of a small cat. Like any text in the Marxist tradition, Marx for Cats gestures in two directions at once. In asking how our society is structured and for whom, Marxism turns towards economic history. And with the materials it finds there, it begins to conceive of how the present might have been different and how the future still could be. In offering a feline narrative of our economic past, I argue that Marxism not only has the potential to be an interspecies project, but that it already is one. And in using the knowledge and those histories presented in this book in cat form, I suggest we may collectively plot a new future together, one which recognizes the work that cats have always done for Marxists, and one which wonders what political commitments Marxists can make to cats. This is less a radical history of a single species than a history of how humans and felines have made each other radical, both radically progressive and radically conservative. In bringing Marxism and cats together, I follow Perry Anderson, who writes that, quote, to take liberties with the signature of Marx is merely to enter the freedom of Marxism, end quote. And what kind of freedom do we enter? Well, it's the freedom to locate a new history. Beginning in the 8th century common era and moving forward into our own day, Marx for Cats should be understood as what the philosopher Walter Benjamin called a tiger sprung or a tiger's leap into the past. Marx often spoke of leaps in describing the movements of capital, and cats leap too, of course, but for now we'll keep our focus on Benjamin, for whom the recollection of a historical moment functions as a kind of return to it. And Benjamin suggests a big cat, a tiger, is the animal to guide us there. In the most revolutionary eruptions of both feudalism and capitalism, and I'm thinking of the peasant uprisings of the Middle Ages, the Paris Commune of the modern age, the queer and communist movements of the 20th century, and each of these radical reformulations of economic power and possibility, cats were present. Take the medieval witch, which a woman of excessive sexuality and uncommon knowledge who was often identified through her relationships with cats, or of Louise Michel, anarchist and Paris communard, who traced her own revolutionary fortitude and her comradeship with animals to her political awakening, and who wrote a series of letters to her cat from penal exile in the South Pacific. Or Rosa Luxemburg, one of my book's more tragic figures, who realized and theorized that capital couldn't be a closed system, that forms of credit and debit-based imperialism would be required to enable accumulation, but who couldn't understand that her love for her cat Mimi or her companionship with the animals who worked in the prison yard where she was incarcerated during World War I might augur an interspecies Marxism. I trust that you can see I've used Anderson's injunction to broaden my archive. Yet the freedom of which Perry Anderson speaks is also the freedom to locate a new Marx, who, it turns out, made use of cats to formulate his theory of revolution, value, and abstraction. In 1848, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels penned the Communist Manifesto, in which they predicted the abolition of the state and private property as a wave of revolution swept through Europe. They proclaimed, quote, all history is the history of class struggle, end quote. A year after those famous words were announced, they were exiled to London, where they congregated with other radicals at London's Red Lion Pub a location whose name recalls the most imperial animal of all. 
And when, three years later, Marx contended in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte with the fact that his predictions had failed to materialize, that the revolutions had dissolved, he now claimed that Europe was operating under the spell of a Katzenjammer, a German for a cat's whale, which had prevented the overturning of capitalism, but from which he believed the continent, the continent would ultimately emerge. Marx wrote, quote, Bourgeois revolutions are short-lived. They have soon reached their zenith, and a long Katzenjammer takes hold of society before it learns to assimilate the results of its storm and stress period soberly, end quote. He compares bourgeois revolutions with their proletarian counterparts and explains that, quote, proletarian revolutions constantly criticize themselves, constantly interrupt themselves in their own course, return to the apparently accomplished in order to begin anew. In their newness and radicality, proletarian revolutions avoid the dreaded Katzenjammer of history. Indeed, all history is the history of cat struggle, too. Marx himself was a great lover of literature and consumed multiple styles, languages, and genres. His writings have an artful and literary playfulness that often go unremarked. Citing the great German philosopher G.W.F. Hegel, for example, Marx explains that, quote, Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historic facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice. He forgot to add, the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce, end quote. Marx for cats should be understood as both. Using the feline and multiple form, the book attends to capitalism's tragedies as well as to the farcical moments that punctuate its history. It tells a cat story of capitalism and delimits the special role that economic history has reserved for cats. From its earliest entreaties of feline glory in the 10th and 11th century feudal era to our own day of zoos and deforestation. From cat shows to wild cat strikes, from lion hunts to cat cafes. And I'll just uh, put the table of contents up here. Um, the the book, you know, tries to to move through a, a large chunk of history, um, about twelve hundred years, um, and in in each uh, sort of section of the book. Um, I choose a particular cat uh, to tell the story of um, capitalism's development in that period and resistance to that development in that period. So you can see there's there are lions, there are common cats, there are lynxes, tigers, wild cats, uh, sabotabbies, black panthers. Um, the book really does try to take uh, an expansive approach uh, both to the subject of the cat, but also to uh, to history itself. And then as the book moves through this economic history, century by century, the feline guides us through its tragedies, sometimes witnessing them, sometimes becoming part of them. And part of the tragedy, for Marxists anyway, has been their failure to appreciate the gravity of this fact. In place of alliance, they have sought domination, whether in Che Guevara's instruction to, quote, study hard to master the techniques which give you mastery over nature, end quote, or Frederick Engels's claim that, quote, the final victory of the socialist proletariat will be a leap of humanity from the animal world into the world of freedom, end quote. Such sentiments were bad enough in previous centuries, but in our own present of climate catastrophe and zoonotic illness, they're simply unacceptable. Um, a quick sort of note on uh, methodology. Um, people often ask me uh, how I how I thought to begin this project, and um, I actually did it through a series of uh, videos that I made uh, in which I would ex explain a particular aspect of Marx's um, oeuvre to cats, so that might be uh, arts commodity status, or what is a commodity, what is labor, what is money, what is value, what is abstraction, uh, so on and so forth. And um, these uh, these videos are archived. You can find them at marksforcats.com. Um, uh, I think they're fun to watch and, and sort of uh, fun to teach with as well. Um, 
but it was in looking through, uh, looking for through lines that the cats might appreciate that I discovered the archive, which subsequently became this book. And it was with the cats on my mind that I conceived of the book as uh, a bestiary. Um, in the Middle Ages, these bestiaries or these illustrated books, depictions of beasts, revealed crucial truths about the hierarchies which structured the God-made world. Medieval bestiaries followed the Bible, uh, excuse me, the guidance offered in the Bible, whose counsel was to, quote, ask the animals and they will teach you, end quote. My preference for the bestiary is that it connects past to the present, that it allows for a visual logic uh, alongside a verbal one, and that most importantly, it takes animals seriously. But bestiaries aspire to a prelapsarian timelessness that require amendment to place them in a properly Marxist frame. And so Marx for Cats is a bestiary that takes a long durée approach to economic history. It was Giovanni Arrighi and his great work on centuries of finance capital, uh, the long 20th century, um, published in 1994, uh, that introduced me to the long durée as method. In the mid-1990s, while trying to understand the import and novelty of late 20th century global financial expansion, Arrighi tarried with the usual questions about periodization. Had capitalism transformed? Had it entered a new phase of development? No, he concluded quite correctly. And he stated that, quote, uh, I'll read this slide. Uh, this is from Arrighi. Um, finance capital is not a particular stage of world capitalism, let alone its latest and highest stage. Rather, it is a recurrent phenomenon which has marked the capitalist era from its early beginnings in the late medieval, no, for its earliest beginnings in late medieval and early modern Europe. Throughout the capitalist era, financial expansions have signaled the transition from one regime of accumulation on a world scale to another. They are integral aspects of the recurrent destruction of old regimes and the simultaneous creation of new ones. Now, what I found in my research and what I try to explicate in the book is that replacing finance capital with CAT accomplishes similar work and allows for the articulation of a feline critique in which CATs designate an autumnal transition between states and stages of capitalism. So Marx for Cats uses an interpretive scheme in which, uh, and I'll read the slide, um, cats are not a particular stage of capitalism, let alone its highest stage. Rather, cats are a recurrent phenomenon which have marked the capitalist era from its earliest beginnings in late medieval and early modern Europe. Throughout the capitalist era, cats have signaled the transition from one regime of accumulation on a world scale to another. They're integral aspects of the recurrent destruction of old regimes and the simultaneous creation of new ones. Um, so that's sort of an overview of the, of the project uh, from the introduction. Um, and now I thought I would uh, read a little bit from um, chapter four, uh, which is called A Revolution of Tigers, which is on the French and, and Haitian revolutions. Um, and uh, one of the things that I, I also took from the, the bestiary form is the, um, the generous use of illustration. Uh, so the book contains about 100 historical images um, of, of cats. Uh, and I'll just start with this one. This is a, a Republican cartoon uh, from, it's, I think the author is actually unknown, but the, the title of the cartoon is um, Adieu Bastille. Um, and you can see the the French Revolutionary, the the Jacobin, sort of uh, cornering the lion uh, and using uh, his power to fight the um, the priests uh, or the Catholic Church um, and the uh, nobility. Um, okay, so this is from uh, Chapter Four. Like the fall of Rome or the rise of capitalism, the origins of the French Revolution have been debated again and again writes Marxist historian Georges Lefebvre in his famous study, The Coming of the French Revolution. It was he who pioneered the term that inspired generations of Marxist social historians, history from below. To write a history of a society, one must look to its lowliest members. In Lefebvre's case, he looked to French peasants. In our case, we will look to French cats 
who are often held in higher station than peasants and proletarians, but who nonetheless will be our entry point into this subterranean history. A bete noir of conservatives in his own day and still in ours, the French Revolution was, according to Marx, quote, the most colossal revolution that history has ever known, end quote. At the height of their historical radicality at the end of the 18th century, French revolutionaries abolished slavery, denuded France of the influence of the Catholic Church, executed their king and queen, and liberated the big cats from the royal menagerie. But that height was a short-lived one, and no sooner did the regal blood dry on the guillotine than the executioners became the executed, slavery was reestablished, and a new emperor, the cat-hating, lion-loving Napoleon Bonaparte, took over. Nonetheless, Marx claims that the revolution constituted, quote, the victory of a new social order. Part of the new social order of which Marx speaks was the dawning of a secular philosophy and literature, of transformed humanistic ideas of citizenship and friendship, as well as a novel kind of science called natural history. In each of these emergent knowledges, we find a series of reinvented cats as well. Take the recording and organization of time. Gone were the 12 months of the Gregorian calendar with their old days of the year, each of which had been named for a particular saint of the Catholic Church. Revolutionaries introduced the French Republican calendar, in which each day of the year was dedicated to a plant, animal, or earthly element. And 25 Nouveaux, which would be our January 14th, uh, became the Day of the Cat, uh, which if you're, if you're quick, you can uh, find, yeah, uh, shot, 25 Nouveaux. In this period's philosophy, freedom became assumed as both a condition for and an end of human flourishing. Quote, man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains, end quote declares the famous first sentence of vegetarian Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Contract. And yet on that book's cover is not a man, but a woman holding the scales of justice and a cat. Uh, so this is the cover of The Social Contract and its first edition. Rather, for Rousseau, the feline was hardly incidental as humans' relationships with cats constituted a kind of index for said humans' particular sensibility toward freedom and tyranny. The Scottish philosopher James Boswell recalls being asked by Rousseau whether he was fond of cats, to which he replied he was not. Rousseau then returned that the question was his test of character and explained to Boswell that those who don't enjoy cats, quote, have the despotic instinct of men, end quote. Rousseau continued, they do not like cats, quote, because a cat is free and will never consent to be a slave. He will do nothing you order as other animals do, end quote. Uh, in the, his allegory on the French Constitution, Pierre-Paul Proudhon presented a cat uh, seated in the middle of the frame, uh, and then the sidebar reads, a cat, symbol of independence, is seated at the floor of liberty. French revolutionaries were guided by Rousseau, but is, what has drawn both Marx and Marxists to their story is the class struggle. We may follow cats through art, culture, scientific and political discourse, in each of which they become an index of the compostable politics of this dawning bourgeois era. Domestic felines were despised by certain vocal elements of the aristocracy, but certainly not all. And anyway, the whole point of the French Revolution was to do away with the aristocracy. Those same domestic cats were mostly embraced by an emergent bourgeoisie who launched an assault on the political power of rent-seeking nobles. And where are the proletarians in this struggle? It is the prospect of their freedom that animates Marxist and Marxist critique. They had their own class resentments against domestic cats who in many cases received better treatment from the bourgeoisie than they did. Yet they also began to advocate for forms of animal freedom distinct from an emerging bourgeois concern with animal welfare. This age truly is one of conflicting alliances, and historical contradiction applies no less to cats than to other subjects of history. We see elements of the class struggle, which is also a cat struggle, in the work of court painter and founder of the Royal Academy of Painting and Arts, Charles Le Brun, 
who produced a remarkable series of human-animal hybrid studies, which included multiple species of cat. Uh, so this is his study of the lion. Of course, there were noble characteristics to be found in the lion, writes historian Peter Salins of this big cat's requisite inclusion. In the lion, we see the lineages of the absolute estate as it was still connected to a feudal history and was expressed through an appreciation of the regal beast. And in men who possess leonine features, the lines of the classical Greco-Roman bust predominate in facial, facial feature as well as form but not so about the domestic cat. Around uh, his face, whom Lebrun noted in his sketches, uh, a series of disparaging ob adjectives, including obstinate, fearful, and wild. The cat likewise marks class longing and resentment in the new secular histories, including that of Comte de Buffon, whose natural history pays special attention to the domestic cat. This is uh, from Buffon's Natural History, the images. Buffon describes the feline as, quote, a faithless domestic. And he goes on to note that he pays, quote, no respect to those who, being fond of beasts, keep cats for amusement. Though these animals are gentle and frolicsome with, when young, they even possess an innate cunning which age increases, which education only serves to conceal. Cats are naturally inclined to theft, and the best education only converts them into servile and flattering robbers. They know how to conceal their intentions, watch and wait, and choose opportunities for seizing their prey. They fly from punishment and remain away until the danger is over and they can return in safety. End quote. Uh, again, and that's from Buffon's Natural History. In the language of the cat, Buffon is also describing an emerging proletariat. Indeed, the substitution of cats for class politics applied to perhaps one of the most radical of the Republican radicals, the man whose name is synonymous with the radicality of, uh, and terror of the French Revolution, Maximilien Robespierre. Robespierre campaigned for universal suffrage, for an abolition of slavery, he supported the women in their march on Versailles and argued for an end to France's imperial wars. Under his leadership, the National Convention indeed abolished slavery in all French colonies, including Haiti, and made all inhabitants of the colonies French citizens. Marx describes him as, quote, the real representative of revolutionary power, i.e. the class alone which was truly revolutionary, the innumerable mass, end quote. But is, if Robespierre is routinely cited as the most radical of the revolutionaries, he's also cited as the most feline. These feline-tented denouncements came from onlookers in France, as well as those in the two countries famous for never having had a proper bourgeois revolution, Germany and England, as their elite inhabitants began to worry that their own countries might follow the example of the French with their revolution. One German publication produced this image of the Jacobin leader with gnarling tigers adorning him. So Robespierre is the top uh, left of the screen. A few weeks after Robespierre's execution, uh, this is during the Thermidor reaction, uh, the, the pamphlet A Portrait of Robespierre was published by uh, Tion V, a deputy who had sat alongside him in the National Convention. Following a similar physiognomic logic of court painter Le Brun, this portrait explained of Robespierre that, quote, people who like to find relationships between faces and moral qualities, between human faces and those of animals, have noted that Robespierre had the face of a cat. But the face altered its physiognomy. At first, Robespierre's was the anxious but fairly soft look of a domestic cat then the wild look of a feral cat, and then the ferocious look of a tiger, end quote. In calling Robespierre a tiger, critics might have been influenced by Buffon's descriptions of the moral failings of the tiger, particularly in comparison with that of the lion. Uh, this is the tiger from Buffon's Natural History. Quote, 
To pride, bravery, and strength, the lion conjoins nobility, clemency, and magnanimity. While the tiger is low and ferocious, cruel without justice, that is to say, without need. End quote. From across the English Channel, British chronicler John Adolphus noted in 1799 that, quote, the ferocity of Robespierre's gaze led an accurate observer to compare his general aspect to that of the cat tiger, end quote. Other revolutionary witnesses claimed that, quote, the tiger Robespierre has presided over a revolutionary politics that is, in essence, a cadavero feminocratic government, a tigracy, end quote. Before his own execution, Robespierre had, in fact, defended the animal. When critics charged him with disobeying the will of God for attempting to secularize society, Robespierre returned, quote, how edifying is the piety of tyrants? Who is this God they're talking of? They call themselves images of God. They assert their, his authority is their work. No, God has created tigers. Kings are the masterpieces of human corruption, end quote. Thus, we're not surprised that defender of the poor and sans culotte, uh, Jean-Paul Morat, had also been accused of being a tiger, as had revolutionary Gracchus Babeuf. Indeed, it was his, in his discussion of Robespierre that Walter Benjamin introduced his conception of the tiger sprung, or the tiger's leap into the path. In his consideration of how revolutionary activity collapses past and present, in order to transform present and future, and this is from the Theses on the Philosophy of History, Benjamin notes that, quote, for Robespierre, antiquity was a past charged with the here and now, which exploded out of the continuum of history. The French Revolution thought of itself as a latter-day Rome. It cited ancient Rome exactly the way fashion cites a past costume. Fashion has an eye for what is up to date, whatever moves in the jungle of the past. It is the tiger's leap into that which has gone before. Only it takes place in an arena in which the ruling classes are in control. The same leap in the open sky of history is a dialectical one, as Marx conceptualized revolution, end quote. It's the strength of the tiger's leap which may break through the ruling class's imaginative and material infrastructure. Unlike a tiger, however, the revolutionary cannot simply leap forward. Rather, she leaps backwards to retrieve a new history, and once she's secured it, she begins to reorder the world. Through revolutionary violence and imagination, this oddly counterintuitive group of French vegetarians and rapacious would-be tigers began to craft a new society from the ruins of the old ones. Feudal, hold, feudal holdovers around Europe, as well as an emergent bourgeoisie, looked on appalled. One English cartoon criticizing the famous French uh, guillotine includes a tiger on the blade of the guillotine. Above and beyond any individual revolutionary, such as Marat or Robespierre, the whole event of the French Revolution began to be condemned as a tigerish affair. On January 7, 1792, the London Times declared that the French had become, quote, set loose from all restraints and in many instances more ferocious than wolves and tigers, end quote. Sir Samuel Romilly reflected on the new French Republic and noted that, quote, one might as well think of establishing a republic of tigers in some forest in Africa, end quote. Indeed, at the height of that revolutionary year of 1793, the True Britain published a poem uh, that was pseudonymous by Tacticus, which both prefaced Walter Benjamin and exhorted his fellow Britons to avoid the example of the French and their animalistic revolution. Uh, and I'll just read the poem. O oh, Britons, to yourselves be true, despise the vile and leprous crew. From apes and tigers sprung, a monkey race, ferocious bred, that snapped the hand by which they're fed, their deeds till now undone. Sometime between 1795 and 1806, English painter George Stubbs produced an uncanny human tiger sketch, which might be said to rival the hybrids of Le Brun. Even the American founding fathers weighed in. 
ensconced in the safety of their slaveholding republic, these New World bourgeois revolutionaries also noted animal features abroad. Excuse me. According to hater of the French Revolution, Hannah Arendt, American President John Adams, quote, was convinced that a free Republican government in France was as unnatural, irrational, and impractical as it would be over the elephants, lions, and tigers in the royal menagerie at Versailles. But tell that to the Jacobins, who indeed liberated Louis XVI's menagerie and invited the animals into their struggle. On August 11, 1792, a group of Jacobins marched into Versailles and declared to the menagerie's director that they had come, quote, in the name of the hands of the creator, um, sorry, in the name of the people and the name of nature in order to liberate these beings that had emerged free from the hands of the creator and been unduly detained by the pomp and arrogance of tyrants, end quote. The lions, tigers, and elephants thus liberated. The beasts marched together with the Jacobins back into Paris, where they were stationed at the Jardin des Plantes, which later became that perversion of revolution known as a zoo. Some historians claim that this tale of animal solidarity is apocryphal, yet it's hardly the only animal act the French revolutionaries undertook. With the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, the Scotsman John Oswald traveled to Paris and joined the Jacobins. He too considered animals part of the oppressed classes. Himself influenced by Rousseau, Oswald argued in his 1791 text, The Cry of Nature, or an appeal to the mercy and justice on behalf of persecuted animals, that's the title, uh, for vegetarianism and political solidarity with all animals. The time had come, he said, to, quote, protect the mute creation from those injuries which the powerful are all but too prone to inflict upon the weak, end quote. Oswald also called for universal arming of the masses to fight oppression and later died uh, in battle in 1793. But tell it to the Marxists, too, including Eric Hobsbawm whose 1962, The Age of Revolution, remains one of the foremost Marxist studies ever conducted of the period and neglects the feline features of the French Revolution almost entirely. This while Hobsbawm um, and his cat Tricia were well known to spend uh, years writing together. Um, Hobsbawm and his study are well known for a different omission, of course, namely that of the French imperial possession, Haiti, and its own world-turning revolution. What we're now in a position to realize is that attending to the former, the cats, would have helped him attend to the latter, Haiti, because the revolution in Haiti was also one of tigers. And in Haiti, too, we also see a Benjaminian tiger sprung. Uh, an anonymous poem at the time of the Haitian Revolution recounted this. This is using the Spanish name for Haiti, uh, Santo Domingo. Uh, Santo Domingo's bloody journal tells of those who would be free. Point to slot, slaughter heap diurnal. That is French fraternity. What has France for Europe done, sir? Set a savage tiger free. Arm the father against son, sir. That is French equality. It was Trinidadian Marxist C.L.R. James, who, bearing his own feline name, the L stands for Lionel, was first able to represent the radical feline history of the Haitian Revolution. And everywhere James saw the tiger. Indeed, this tiger sprung, of which Benjamin used to refer to Robespierre in 1940, had already been revealed as a practice for writing and conceptualizing radical history in James's 1938 study of the Haitian Revolution, the Black Jacobins. For example, James recounts that when the revolution on the island reached its pinnacle and victory was imminent, uh, rebel leader Toussaint Louverture declared to his forces that, quote, this is no longer a war, it is a fight of tigers. And it is no longer bravery I want from you. It is rage, end quote. He got it. Thousands of mixed race, sometimes free and other times enslaved Haitians, joined the revolution against the French colonists, colonists. And James tells us repeatedly that they, quote, fought like tigers. When Louverture died in French captivity, Haitian revolutionary Jean-Jacques Dessalines succeeded him and declared Haiti a free, free republic to the world. 
But while Lofartur was alive, he was so feared and admired that James reports, quote, even Dessalines, a tiger, was afraid of Lovatur, a tiger. In James's study, the tiger is omnipresent. However, we notice a certain feline divergence, too. He uses a language of the tiger in appreciation of revolutionary fortitude, yet the received antisocial association of the tiger likewise persists. For example, when James described the moment in which Lovatur heard of Napoleon's order to reverse emancipation and restore slavery to Haiti, he reports that Lovatur, quote, could not believe that the French ruling class would be so depraved. He could not admit to himself and his people that it was easier to find decency, gratitude, and justice than in a cage of starving tigers, than in the councils of French imperialism, end quote. One aristocratic French chronicler on the island noted in her memoirs of Dessalines that, quote, he is a bloodthirsty tiger, and one can say that without any metaphor, end quote. Her point is somewhat baffling. Dessalines was clearly a human. But it does show us the limits of metaphor as a figure of speech. This memoir desi desire to consign Dessalines beyond the world of humanity, a world that Marxists like Guevara and Engels have also desired to escape. A metaphorical operation, however, requires that a separation be maintained between the objects of comparison. So, for example, when this person runs, she is a cheetah, necessitates that the distinction between human and feline be kept so that the latter's speed, a cheetah, can be transposed onto the former. When we say she runs like a cheetah, the speed is the element of comparison. But these memoirs, and there are many, refer, refuse to maintain the separation. It provides a metaphor, the black revolutionary is a tiger, and then negates it. My claim is not metaphorical. In fact, it offers a lesson that C.L.R. James himself hints at at the Black Jacobins, but would not fully articulate until some 10 years later in his notes on dialectics. And the lesson is this. To revolt, one must become a tiger, because in a revolution, one must leap. What James, what Benjamin, what our archive here instructs us is that the tiger is not a metaphor, but rather a dialectic. And dialectics are a different creature. They do not separate. Rather, they unite in contradiction. And in doing so, they make sense where none before was to be found. To move from one object to another, one state of being to another, one historical moment to another requires a leap. So, for instance, C.L.R. James recounts that Toussaint Louverture moved by, quote, tigerish leaps. And indeed, for James, there's no more a dialectic term than leap, which fittingly takes both noun and verb forms, and which appeared to him in his analysis of Haiti through the language of the tiger. But as C.L.R. James's own Marxism developed in the 1940s, he moved away from the tiger and trained his focus on that beast's signature move, the leap. In a narrative language unusual for a theoretician, James explains how he came to this figure of the leap. He recalls reading cat-loving Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin's exposition of Hegel, in which Lenin isolated Hegel's use of the leap as a figure of both categorical and historical transition. Lenin noted in the passage in his notebook, and on reading it, James recounts, quote, I was particularly struck by this in Lenin. Hegel is very irritating. He sticks to method. He does not shout. But every one of his transitions involves a leap. And James emphasizes this in his um, notebook on Hegel's The Science of Logic. Um, and he, he in, his, uh, in his dialectics, studies in dialectics, this is how James presents um, the passage. And I found the typography quite interesting here. So he says, quote, in reading the section on quality and the doctrine of being, Lenin writes in very large writing, leap, 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 leap. That obviously hit him hard. For James, the materiality of the spacing, the capitalization, and the repetition all serve to accentuate how crucial the leap was for understanding dialectics and ultimately for understanding radical social change. James continues, 
This passage is of great importance, and Lemon has summarized it perfectly with his leap, 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 leap. The new thing leaps out. Lennon didn't have to wait to see anything. It was there. It would leap up. Um, and I'll close with a return to Marx, who did not include tigers in his voluminous prose, but certainly included cats and lions. Um, but Marx also does repeatedly use the figure of the leap. In Capital Volume 1, he writes that, quote, as the general conditions requisite for production by the modern industrial system have been established, this mode of production acquires a capacity for extension by leaps and bounds, end quote. Elsewhere, Marx writes that capitalist labor can, quote, leap over the limit of individual humans, end quote. He reminds us then of capitalism's revolutionary power through its leaps. Benjamin does so through the dialectic's counterpower and through tiger leaps. James provides the idea of leaps in material form. And now it's time that we as Marxists leap into a new mode of critique and enter species mode, which can offer us a different understanding of our past and hopefully of our future as well. Uh, and I will just close there. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lee. <clears throat> um, as I said, it's a wonderful book. I encourage everyone to read it if you have not already. Uh, we can now leap into uh, discussion and questions and comments. Uh, I'd first like to call on uh, Tarika Hapoja, who has been uh, co-leading a class series here at the Marxist Education Project on multi-species Marxism. So if you'd like to say a few words about that class, and then maybe uh, if you're able to pose the first uh, question or comment to, to Lee. Thank you, uh, Fred, and thanks uh, so much, Lee Claire, for this incredibly inspiring uh, talk. Um, this book has been really, really great, uh, a great thing to come up uh, now. And just uh, briefly as a context, uh, I'm, my name is Terry Gaub, I'm, I'm a visual artist, and I've been working on multi-species politics for quite a long time, almost over 50, 15 years. And um, since 2022, I've been co-leading a class for our Marxist ed education project on Marxism and animals or animals and capitalism um, with Fred for the first two years. And then this year with Gizem Haspolat, who's also here present. Um, and the aim of this, uh, these classes have, has been to try to kind of locate what I think you've also been talking about, uh, Lee Claire, in some other talks about the um, sort of void in, in leftist or um, anti-capitalist theory in talking about animals and then also in animal liberation circles in, you know, really having a rigorous uh, kind of anti-capitalist or analysis of capitalism um, and from this kind of creative uh, point of view. And uh, the first year, uh, I want to just mention the first year we centered uh, Alex Blanchett's uh, Poor Copolis, American Animality, standardized, oh. standardized Life, and the Factory Farm. And I'm very happy to see Alex also present here. I think I, at least I saw them here. Um, and um, yes, so thank you for, for doing this. It's been really amazing to see all this new work come out. Uh, that's kind of, it feels like there's a, there's a moment for this, this discourse that things are coming together and people are really feeling the need to, to bring animals into this conversation. Um, I have so many questions, um, but um, yeah, I guess um, one that um, that I was thinking when you were talking is that there is this, of course, the question of, um, I mean, clearly, well, the way you draw the narrative, um, you show in a very, really, really beautiful way how our imagination is animalistic in a way, and, and therefore also our cultures are animalistic, they're sort of formed around our relationship with the non-human world and we're completely entangled. Our, our ideas of what life is or what we are are entangled. And it's interesting because usually um, usually we talk about the, this kind of entanglement through the notion of dehumanization or animalization. And there's like, there, those are usually very different animals. <laughs> and felines are not those mm -hmm. animals that are typically woven into these narratives of mm -hmm. dehumanization. So I think, I think this is like an interesting 
uh, aspect uh, of of your work, and that that cats and uh, and probably all animals occupy a very particular place in the multi species community, like as as creatures. And so I, I don't know if um, this is kind of one question. Um, maybe I don't know if that that. Um, um, maybe just to go, go off a little bit further from that, um, the one thing that I was thinking was the kind of um, connection between the actual physical animals and then the the symbolic animals and the imagination around animals and then the actual uh, physical coexistence with felines in this case. I don't know if you want to say something more about that relationship. Sure. Um, no, thank you for that. And it's nice to finally be on the same Zoom screen with you. We, we've been uh, trying to make that happen. Um, and I also did see Alex uh, Blanchett here. And I also do want to say that his book, uh, Porkopolis, is um, is a really wonderful, a truly amazing read. Um, yeah, I think that I think that you're quite right to say that, um, you know, one of the one of the aims of the book is to try to create a a discursive and um, sort of uh, imagination based space for holding together uh, material animals in the here and now, historical animals in the archive, uh, and the plethora of um, symbols that circulate through human culture, um, particularly cats. You know, I, I, I hate to, um, as a Marxist, make a, a sort of supra-historical claim, but I really do think that they're one of the most represented animals in human culture, cats. I mean, felines at, at large. Um, and, you know, one of the sort of, um, one of the, 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 impetuses I had for this book was um, seeing really the huge number of Marxists who who do quite le deeply love their cats. I mean, that is a genuine love that, that they have. But, uh, you know, like Rosa Luxemburg, do not expand that to a politics. That stays a private affection. That stays a private joy. It stays almost a, a sort of uh, commodity attachment to a, a being that they that they own and care for. Um, and I wanted to sort of try to um, use Marxist method, which is looking at the accumulation of evidence over history in an economic frame, right, to say, what would it mean to challenge our own relationship to other animals, animals that we don't profess to love or that we don't profess to be in community with, right? And, um, of course, what I found is that there's a historical record of you know, really going back almost oh, 600, no, 400 years um, of of political radicals and political revolutionaries who were trying to foment this sort of radical interspecies politics with animals and are who, who are castigated, who are um, derided, who are told that this isn't a real politics. Um, and, you know, the gambit of the book is that it, it might not be a real politics in the Marxist record, but it has certainly been a real politics in the imagination and production of that record. And if we can be a little bit sort of liberal and creative with our, our understanding of what constitutes an archive, then we can really draw this kind of feline historical trajectory, which I hope can produce a different interspecies um, politics in the present. We'll see. Um, I think that what doesn't produce that or what doesn't seem to produce that is, you know, telling people to change their mind or, you know, stop eating meat or don't support factory farming, you know, whatever it is. I mean, this is, you know, there's a sense at, at which a, a sort of didactic um, politicking doesn't seem to work in relation to animals. So can we find another way? Um, but yeah, thank you for that, that, um, that opening question. I appreciate that. Okay, if you noticed in the chat, you may type the word stack. S-T-A-C-K in the chat, and we'll add you to the speaker's stack. Or you can do, as Nate has just done, uh, raise your hand using the Zoom feature. Uh, so, Nate, go ahead. Oh, hey. Thanks for this conversation. It's really, uh, really inspiring. Um, and I was just wondering, going back to the sort of interspecies question, 
as you were conducting this research on the feline <laughs> in history, did you come mm -hmm. across uh, thinking about the canine? Because there's such a tension, at least in U.S. culture, between feline and canine. I was just wondering if yeah. that popped up. And yeah. Should we expect oh. a sequel? <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody suggested, uh, you're right to note there's a tension. Uh, somebody suggested a sequel, uh, uh, fascism for dogs, you know, considering their use. And I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get involved. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think that, that dogs are fascists or that people who have them are fascists. But um, no, you shouldn't expect a sequel anytime soon. Um, although I do have a book coming out next year uh, called Fake Work, uh, but it's not a sequel to this. But it, it is a sequel to me, <laughs> to me having a thought. Um, but to, to, go to, your, um, to go to your question, uh, you know, I get asked often in the archive, of what other animals were there. I think you're asking a part of that question and you're focusing on a one that's, you know, obviously um, would be quite expected. Um, and yes, I think that there, there could be, uh, there could be different iterations of marks for cats that would use different animals. Um, I think there could be a telling of this story with horses uh, perhaps with dogs, with birds, I mean, surprisingly, you know. Um, but I will also say that one of the things that is so interesting about the cat in Western political economic history is that um, it, it really has a sort of span or sort of capture of the imagination as an anti-authoritarian, anti-work creature uh, really for at least since the 13th century, so uh, late 1100s, early 1200s. And that makes it an ideal animal to span the transition from feudalism and capitalism, not feudalism to capitalism. And of course, Marx says the history of capitalism begins in feudalism. And he also says the Middle Ages are histories, are human histories, uh, zoological period right mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of there's a lot of work of animals i think in terms of uh the middle ages as different kinds of subjects but but that they retain cats in particular this sort of anti-authoritarian anti-work logic as the transition happens um was so was so fascinating to me and i can't think of another animal uh as consistently that does retain that's that identity um, but I did find, and if you, if you buy Nate, uh, the book and read the book, I think it's in the second chapter, uh, what I think is, is one of the earliest references I've seen to the cat dog divide. Uh, it, it was, you know, a group of, uh, Dominicans, uh, were ferreting out of, uh, 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 some heretics in, uh, maybe 11th century, what is now, uh, Italy, Northern Italy. And the Dominicans made a joke about themselves um, that in Latin, you know, Dominican, Dominicatus uh, could also be translated as the, the Lord's dogs. And so these dogs were going to ferret out these heretical cats. So uh, there's some there's some gesture to that. I enjoyed finding that reference. Um, but, yeah, long answer to a good question. Okay, there is a uh, question in the chat from Kessel, uh, which maybe you have seen, but she says, I would love to hear Lee, Lee Claire's takeaways on how we might rethink comradeship and friendship based on what we've learned from this book. Uh, takeaways, oh, okay, on, on how we might rethink comradeship and friendship. Um, I assume that's, sort of interspecies comradeship and friendship, I would imagine. Uh, because that's that's sort of what I took from it. And I think it sort of um I think it it what I I guess what I would say about that is, you know, um one of the things that I think a, a Marxist analytic frame provides and one of the things that really makes it unique is that um 
it doesn't just trot out an individual case, um, but rather it always gestures towards a larger structural problem, right? So, um, you know, it's considered um, a, a sort of mark of bourgeois sentiment or bourgeois sentimentality uh, to, for example, you know, care about your your own child's suffering, but not care about the suffering of all children. Um, and we know that in the 19th century, when Marx and Engels were writing, you know, when these sort of bourgeois societies were forming prevention for the Society for the Friends of the Cruelty of Animals, or the Anti-Vivisection Society, or liberal establishments in late 19th century, early 20th century uh, Victorian England um, that were... That, that that attempted to motivate a concern for child labor or or sex workers or you know whatever the case may be um, but what what was so derisive or what was what, what warranted such derision from from Marx and Engels themselves even in the case of animals was this idea that individual flourishing and individual suffering uh, and as, as a sense of, of friendship or comradeship are to be attended to, but structural flourishing of of people of animals is not to be attended to, um, and I think that that's that's something that you know I don't I don't want to use superlatives because I don't I don't necessarily think they're helpful, um, but I I I do continue to be impressed um, by the number of Marxists or or socialists or people on the left who you know, who decry animal suffering, who decry climate change, who decry factory farming, and yet that doesn't become a politics. And so that's how I would answer the question about comradeship and friendship, right? Which is like, how is it that that people can imagine a comradeship or a friendship with their own animal, their own cat, their own dog, but not with animals as a class? And and what do we need? And again, this sort of goes back to the question um, that Terika posed. What what do we need to sort of pry, pry that space loose conceptually and imagine like an interspecies uh, flourishing, you know? Um, and so one of the gambits of the book is that we already possess, we already possess the uh, experiences to do so um, in relationship to animals that we know or that are already in our lives. Um, but that takes making it a politics, making it an interspecies politics. Um, and that's something that many people are, are not willing to do uh, and that I hope is changing and will change um, so that we can have a sort of interspecies comradeship and, and friendship. And again, I mean, not to repeat myself, but I can think of so many people who, if I said, are you, do you have a friendship and comradeship with your own cat, would say yes, but that does not, they do not extrapolate that to the case of animals as a politics. Um, yeah, so, again, another good question. Okay, let me call on uh, George. Hi, thank you. Excellent uh, presentation. I'm enjoying myself. What? Um, one thing I'm wondering about, though, is how did the image of the tiger come to differ so much from the image of the lion? you have any thoughts oh. on ideas? Oh, gosh. Uh, I can think of several things. Um, you know, um, tigers were, were gifted uh, to European royals and nobles. Uh, sorry, lions were gifted to European nobles and royals. Uh, more frequently uh, than tigers in the sort of mid to late feudal period. And by mm, at, uh, the 11th century, the 12th century, I mean, lions had be, had really become a, a symbol of, of the royal, I mean, they're still, they're still the symbol of the British royal family. I mean, this is a very long tradition. Um, but cats, you know, cats, of all sorts, felines, I should say, that had black in them uh, were, were, were signaled out for um, a special kind of critique. So black cats, black panthers, uh, what cats have the spots? Leopards. Um, the idea that these cats could be bringing, um, in addition to their sort of demonic uh, presences, blackness into a space um, 
was a particular concern. And so I think that the that the tiger's um, stripes, that the black stripes on the tiger, um, in addition to the fact that tigers were not they they were not in the same circulation as as lions mm-hmm. um, had something to um, to do with it. Um, and then by as you, you know from the presentation, you know by the by the 18th century, the the associations are really are really set uh, in terms of lion, royal, and noble. That would make sense. But yeah, tiger, fearsome, and loathsome. Okay, thank you. Okay, further questions or comments? Uh, I wonder if uh, Gizem Haspalat has uh, any uh, comment to make. If I can put you on the spot for a moment. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much. This was such a fascinating book. And like while reading um, one particular sentence about uh, those who probably read too much on the animals, this book contained um, some images to kind of like remind them all of the connections between marks and cats in general. So I felt targeted in a very good way. <laughs> and actually, like as a person who's currently in the process of writing a dissertation, the thing that intrigues me the most about this book is it's, um, I guess, like this kind of like novelties that it, it introduces uh, to the academic pros, I would say. Yeah. Like I have encountered many memes, historical drawings, illustrations, and you kind of like briefly touched upon, of course, the significance of those. Um, but I would love to hear you mm-hmm. talk more about this, um, assuming that this has something to do with you wanting yeah. to uh, perhaps make non-human animal yeah. politics um, seem less didactic or more relatable. Um, so this is perhaps it's a great question yeah yeah it's a great question Um, so the book of course came out with Duke University Press which is a university press Uh, that's the title Um, and it's an academic book in the sense that you know it follows academic models of citation you know it's a it's a historical book obviously there's I don't even know 50 pages of footnotes, too many. I mean, because the historical sweep is so broad. Um, you know, and, and there's a real message to the book, which is the one of how do we get animals into a sort of sense of belonging with a with a revolutionary class, with a revolutionary critique. That is an absolutely genuine message. Um, but there's another sense in which the book is sort of a satire, and it's sort of a satire of male Marxists. And particularly people like, uh, for example, um, Perry Anderson, whose who's, uh, words I borrow to begin the book, right? Um, who, you know, who, who has also written books like Lineages of the Absolute Estate or um, Passages from Antiquity to Feudalism, you know, these broad, these broad sweeps of a sort of master narrative of history, like war, 1200 to 1900, or David Graeber, not that he's a Marxist, but debt, the first 5,000 years. Um, you know, there's there's something, I think, very uh, sort of masculine and all-knowing in the worst sense of a Marxist critique that these books produce and replicate um, that I wanted to play with, right? So what does it mean to then say, like, okay, th- we're going to do a long during history. We're going to read it. We're going to go through the archive, but it's not going to be about money. It's not going to be about war. It's not going to be about statecraft or debt uh, or gold or grain or, you know, whatever. It's going to be cats. And um, so that, in the sense, is a it's a way of really thinking about you know, you said you're writing a dissertation. I'm, I'm sure not everybody in this in this chat is an is an academic but I do give this presentation a lot to academics and you know what is the state of um, academia and academic publishing and and um, for whom are we writing and to what end um, if if you know not to sort of belabor the point but um, but the aca- the academy the professoriate it's at a in a real cry I mean it's not able to reproduce itself 
as a class. And these, you know, it's not able to give its graduate students jobs. People retire, the jobs aren't replaced. I think now in the American Academy, about 77% of work is done by contingent labor, by adjunct labor. I mean, it's a, it's a very sorry scene. And if that's the scene of, of the academy, then in another sense, that's the scene of academic publishing. And this book wants to play with that and, and, and wants to invite thinking about it. Um, but then, you know, I'm glad that you said you enjoyed seeing the images, seeing the pictures, you know, see, thinking about the memes. I mean, because there's a there's another sense in which I think, um, you know, a Marxist politics has often, though not always, but often sort of um, it has an association of a of a disavow of pleasure, of a disavow of fun. And, you know, we'll study now and we'll we'll pick up the party once the revolution has arrived. And I think that's a very alienating message. And so this this book is also asking us to have fun with learning about economic history, right? To say that to understand the economic present, we have to understand the economic past. Um, and how can we do that in a manner that's engaging, that's pleasurable, that's fun? The book was a lot of fun to write. You know, I've written other academic books. This one was the most fun. Um, I hope it's fun to read. I hope it's I hope people could pick it up and 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 start thinking about, you know, Marx and animal politics as sort of conjoined processes in a way they hadn't before. You know, what if what if every cat lover could be a Marxist? My God, what a different political world we would inhabit. So thank you for that question. I see a yeah, cat in the back of uh, Fred. Yeah, that's great. And it is, of course, a pleasure to read, and I, I cannot already, like, wait to teach it. Um, so oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. I'm excited to hear that. Thanks. Uh, I guess someone was raising their hand, but um, uh, I think you're muted, Fred. You're right. Uh, Riss had their hand up. I just wanted to check if you still wanted to speak, Riss. Okay, uh, Gizem, did you have more to say? Or? Uh, Paul, Paul looks like. Paul, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, anyone else here? Um, anyone? Yeah, Gizem. Done. Yeah, please okay. go ahead. <laughs> I yeah, have a million questions, but please. Yeah. Yeah. Very, um, there was an earlier point about the the uh, cats and dogs. A uh, very very nice. Um, actually, I never knew about the lions and tigers. Uh, Lay that was a very illuminating that um, interesting thing about that. Is there going back to the other person asked about uh, cats and dogs? I was thinking the lion we always see is the king of the jungle and mm -hmm. the the ruler in a in a feudalist sense. But the wolf, when you think about the wolf, the wolf is that wild survivalist and the anarchist. Mm -hmm. And how does that come about? The wolf. How does a wolf come about as a wild survivalist? Or, or no, no, the 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 contrast or the juxtaposition. You know, we don't see the the wolf as the as the could be the king of the jungle. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know, um, and I don't think I I came across yeah. that many references to wolves in the, the research. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean. Definitely, the by the night, late nineteenth, early twentieth century, the black cat is the anarchist. I mean, and and still to this day, uh, more so I think than the wolf. But um, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that uh, question. Uh, yeah, a comrade the, from the Netherlands says the wolves of Hobbes. Mm. Interesting. I think about Jack London. Um, call it a wild. And... Uh, okay, or the founding of Rome with Romulus and Remus. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't. Uh, I mean, I, I I know these particular mo moments in history of the founding of Rome and and so much, but I, I don't. I'm not sure how to make sense of the yeah. question in in the in yeah. this archive. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just going to mention that uh, our friend David McNally uh, wrote a book called Monsters of the Market. Zombies, Ooh. vampires, and global capitalism. I was just look, taking a look at that to see if there was any reference to werewolves. 
as well, but uh, it's basically about zombies and vampires. I think the werewolf is mm-hmm. not uh, not part of the picture, but uh, be that as it may. Um, anyone else uh, would like to make a question, ask a question, and make a comment? I feel bad because I already went, but if no one else has a question, I have one more. Um, but I, I would see to anyone else. Sure, go ahead. We have about twenty more minutes. Uh, and yeah, Nate, go ahead. Okay, uh, Lee, my my Marxism is a little rusty, but um, I was just thinking about the idea of commodity fetishization, mm-hmm. fetishization, which I can't say, and I'm sure you probably cover this in the book, which I haven't read yet, and I need to. Um, but I'm wondering if um, part of what you do in the work is think about the ways in which animals themselves end up being fetishized in uh you know human discourse or i'm not sure i'm wondering if there's a connection between the kind of mechanism of fetishization and the role that animals as symbols play maybe um well let's see i mean the the fetishization of the commodity is the sort of privileging of its its objecthood the sort of immediacy of its objecthood over the uh durability of of its its history and its and its making and the sort of labor um, that went into it. Um, so, I mean, of course, I I talk about how there's a shift in the late medieval into early modern period where animals sort of cease to be treated as subjects, you know, as economic subjects, as household subjects. Um, and start to be treated as what we would call commodities. And, at, you know, at the same time that labor starts to be treated as what we would call a commodity. Um, so there's a sort of there's a sort of general sense of that. Um, but I think in terms of uh, in terms of the Marxist discourse, you know, the, the fetishization of commodities. No, I think it probably plays less of a role than the idea of, you know, um, the sort of earlier Marx of like, who is a subject of emancipation? Who is a subject of political um, solidarity? And I mean, one thing that that in terms of this division between what we see in the Middle Ages and what we see with the rise of capitalism that, you know, I found during this research and I continue to find just completely amazing is that, um, you know, when I say that animals were subjects, like uh, some of the cases that I cite in the book um, sort of in medieval Switzerland or what we you know, say be Switzerland, sort of southern France, northern Italy. Um, animals were put on trial. They were given counsel. I mean, they were charged with crimes. Like there's a there's a sense of their sort of economic and social and political being that is almost unrecognizable um, with the sort of capitalist instrumentation that starts to begin in the 16th and 17th century. So I draw that contrast, but not so much with that particular uh, discourse. No, I think I'm more engaged with like the discourse of, of money, of value, of, of circulation constituting time frames and sort of geopolitical frames um, a bit more than the, than the sort of um, particular uh, yeah. Fetish of commodities. Yeah. Uh, Tarika, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I was thinking um, a lot of the. I was. It was interesting that when you know throughout the book you talk about the, and now when you talk about the cats, you talk about them especially as like anti-authoritarian and anti-work. Mm-hmm. That they represent this sort of radical. They sort of represent agency uh in some way uh animal agency or what we maybe idealize as agency as kind of not not being completely subordinated uh that there's a radical i mean um quality of uh, you know anyone knows a cat who drops everything they want you know from the table like every time so there's a revolutionary um uh, kind of character in how cats exist in the world uh, but then a lot of the stuff that comes out of like anim- critical animal studies around um, mm. kind of capitalism is around labor and is focused mm. on laboring animals and whether animals labor and what's mm-hmm. the value process uh, with non-human, the work of non-human animals or, or any like non-human entity or process. 
And then I'm thinking of like, okay, well, we also have this huge pet industry at the moment mm. where non-human animals are really commodified in a way, but mm. they're also becoming this weird mix of um, they're commodified as commodity objects, but at mm. the same time, they're family members. Yep. <laughs> that, and that can like swap, you know, from one day to another, you can kind of swap between that. Um, so I guess this is my, my question is like, um, about cats and labor or cats as laborers because you could say that pets are not only commodity uh, you know com mm -hmm. commodities but they're also performing yeah. kind of emotional yeah. labor yeah. so it's kind of like something maybe also going to the future of like what's what's mm -hmm. our feline human uh, coexistence going yeah. to be look like if capitalism yeah. continues like this yeah. uh, great question um, and um yeah, I think I think more animal studies is starting to take up the question of labor. But when I was writing this book in 2020, 2021, I don't think that was a prominent question. I don't think that question that gets the prominence it needs. Now, um, I hope it continues. I agree with you that those questions are starting. Um, the last book I wrote before this one is called Wages Against Artwork. And there was a chapter on animals as uh, potential artistic laborers and in that chapter I sort of tarried with this question like within a properly Marxist frame can animals be considered laborers and in that book which came out in 2019 I concluded that the answer is no they can't be in the in a in a sort of analytic Marxist frame and I still think that's true but I think the difference is I don't really care anymore and if 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 they can't be, then it's time to update the frame, right? So there's a sense of my own attachment to a kind of a kind of conservative philosophical tradition, which on the one hand I think is great to think with, but on the other hand runs into into problems. Um, so do they labor? Do they produce value? Uh, yeah, I think we have to say yes, but I don't I don't yet think we have the proper mechanism for understanding how that um, valorization happens in the way we do with humans. Um, so that's like work to be done and I hope it is being done and I'm excited to see um, more of it being done. But um, are they still sort of members of our economic community and uh, do we need to find a language for addressing how that is the case other than them simply being bought and sold, killed and sold, whatever the case may be? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we absolutely do. Um, I'm reading a book right now that I don't know if people know called Subaltern Studies 2.0 that thinks about using the history of um, animal relations and subaltern communities as a way to engage a kind of interspecies politics. Um, and I'm happy to send you the reference, um, Tarika. I forget the author's name at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think it's crucial work and important work. Um, and, you know, I hope I uh in some part can contribute to it i don't know that i did in a technical way in this book but i hope i did in a sort of discursive and visual way yeah absolutely did yes ah, okay <laughs> okay anyone else at all we'll just pause for a moment or two and see if anyone else has thoughts or comments or questions or Lee Claire, you may want to uh, sum up for us a bit, uh, or not. No, I think, I, I think I've said enough. No, I think I've said enough. Um, I have a short oh. question. Okay, go ahead. What's What's next in your mind? What's What are you working on next? Where? Oh, okay. Uh, the book is called uh, Fake Work. It does I don't even have the title down, but the book is called Fake Work, uh, and it'll be coming out next year. Um, and it is, um, do, do you remember, do people remember Y2K, that, you know, that idea that, that everything was going to shut down? Okay, so. Um, uh, I, that was working, right after... I was working at IT at the time, and we were having meetings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I got out of college, and I worked for um, a management consultancy for a year on a Y2K project, or an anti-Y2K project, a sort of Y2K prophylactic Um <laughs> And um, the company that I that I worked well that I worked with um, was the same company that was auditing Enron. Uh, it's called Arthur Anderson, uh, sort of a 
they were engaging in a bunch of fraudulent stuff, but you know what? It's all a fraud. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's sort of an account of how working at this company and working with corporate knowledge and in a corporate scene and working with people engaged in accounting fraud, uh, was in many ways my like introduction to political economy and why I started thinking about political economy um, and why I started reading Marx. Um, and so, yeah, this book uh, explores that. Um, it's not an academic book. It's, it's, uh, it's you know, very few footnotes. Um, but uh, there is a, there's a continuity in the sense of finding ways to think about political economy, to think about Marxism that are, sort of, I hope, open the conversation to more people and to new people in new spaces. Sounds great. Uh, yeah, it opens up this, um, all your work, also the previous book and this one, the, the different facets of work and non-work and almost yes. like this surrounding the recognized wage labor as... as Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the hope. Absolutely. Yeah, there is a continuity there. Yeah, absolutely. Does it does it bear any relationship at all to David Graeber's uh, bullshit jobs? Or? I mean, you know, I get I get asked that often. It's funny. I think David Graeber is a little bit too glib and bullshit. Job. I mean, yes. Was it a bullshit job? Yes, absolutely. Um, but, you know, to me, it was actually quite meaningful. Um, so and I think a lot of bullshit is a, is quite meaningful. Um, in a way that I don't know that he accounts for, uh, so it bears it bears some it bears some relationship. You could maybe say it's a kind of memorization, um, but I do also just try to take corporate knowledge production seriously. Like if 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 it all is bullshit, what does it look like, and and what does it what do you do, and how do you do it, and how do you manage it? Um, so yeah, I think that's a a, a good parallel. Okay, we will invite you back to talk about that book. Fake so, work. Okay, look forward to ten. it. Sounds like more fun. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, all the cats, for uh, having their patient, having patience for, the, for this. And uh, we uh, look forward to more opportunities to discuss Marxism, politics, and uh, the state of the world with you all and with Lily Claire. Um, Thank you to, all, and I'm so glad that you guys run this series. It's so exciting. Thank you for inviting me, and thank everybody for coming. Okay, we will be uh, at least putting you all on our mailing list for, for one mailing, and uh, you're welcome to uh, persist with us uh, or take yourself off when you get it. So uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay, bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Fred. Thank you. Bye-bye.